Hey everybody. Hi. Just uh just in the usual pre-stream, just double checking it's working. Cause you know, I am paranoid about this not working. Uh also Jake's uh maybe co located with with here. Hey everybody. I am. Hi. Yep, we've got sound, that's good. Just the usual awkward <laughs> awkward checking what's going on we are streaming uh, from the same place yeah if, if um some of you may know jake and i both used to live in melbourne uh, except on opposite sides of it so we streamed from separate houses then he moved to australian texas um also known as queensland and but he's in melbourne so we're we're chilling at the same place I'd like to say drinking a beer or something like that, but neither of us are really drinking, so um, I don't even know why I went there. This uh, is true. Yes. Uh, uh, why did that? I ha I have to say, as a weird observation, Jake. Yeah. Being in the same room and talking to a microphone is much <laughs> different than being like at least talking to a microphone like psychologically in your head. I don't know if anyone else here has ever done this. But I feel like I'm talking to Jake. But when he's in the same room, I feel like we're just talking at a microphone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I anyway. What, I know what you mean. I feel the same. Anyway, today we're having a pump tat buffer overflows. Uh, so l the reason why we didn't stream last week was I had made a critical error in my... Uh, like we were prepping and I was like, this is coming down to the wire and it's not working. I can't get it working. And um, yeah, dirty Queensland. <laughs> exactly. Um, anyway, it was coming down to the wire and I was like, this isn't working. Then literally like 10 minutes after we called it, we were like, no stream tonight, guys. Sorry, we've just got to prep. Uh, I figured out my, what my problem was. Or maybe it was like 30 minutes later. But, <laughs> you know, I just, I just messed up. I keep getting messages. Ah. Oh. Sorry, I should ignore those. That's um, right. Yeah, so I, 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 yeah, it turned out that I was treating bytes wrong in Python. <laughs> yeah. And once I'd done that and through that, I was able to actually execute my buffer overflow. So let's hop on over to VMware oh, and see. You keep telling me I can just hit spacebar, but I never do. You can, yeah. Um, come on, come on, resolution. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Control or N32. Oh, there we are. That is not my password. <laughs> oh. Okay, so I'll just clear this. This was just from where we were quickly testing this worked earlier. So if you remember the last few streams I've done, or couple, first one we did, Jake, what did we do? You can't even remember. <laughs> oh, man. We did reversing. Oh, we did. We did reversing yeah. stuff. So yeah. reversing where you debugging. We, reversing was where you decompiled an application, um, and then overwrote um, or, or changed. Sorry. Uh, can, okay. I, can I you claim jet lag for yeah. a one hour time zone? No, I can just claim <laughs> stupidity. So reverse engineering or decompiling, you decompile the code, change some elements of it, recompile it, and you change the behavior of the application. Perhaps we should have done, like, narratively, debugging probably would happen before you reverse engineer because yes. you debug to yeah. watch application behavior and flow. So in that, I just outright abused changing registers to change where you go um, and then changing the zero flag to uh, change the outcome of a... Like a jump, not equal a comparison. Compare, yeah. yeah, or a compare. So then in reversing, you just change the code. So once you figure that out, you might go for a reverse engineering um, approach yeah. and try and then change the bit of code you want to change, you know, that does a particular thing to force the outcome you want. Uh, in the more nefarious world, actually, I will recommend there is a YouTuber called Modern Video Gamer who talks about how consoles were often compromised. I was just looking at Jake. It's so weird to be in the same room as yeah. someone else. Um, um, and that's that's really cool. So, you know, how these things were done with buffer overflows and reverse engineering binaries and how you overrode disk firmware and all of that. So 
modern video gamer. I'll stick the link in the description once the stream's over. Um, but he's got some pretty cool stuff about this. Uh, and there's some other stuff as well. Um, and then the third thing, and we're using a debugger again, but we're looking for a buffer overflow. So I was going to use Excel to demonstrate this, but it was not cooperating. But I'm... I... Yeah, so instead of changing the app to app the application execution flow, we are changing if what a... code the application actually runs. You could just call it like runtime code deployment. That's what I snarkily <laughs> Run call it. Runtime code deployment. I wonder yeah. if I can just use a... If there is a, oh, yeah, a web spreadsheet I can just use without logging in to, to do this. Um just yeah, just because so... I, I want to <laughs> demonstrate kind of oh yeah sweet how some some of the key components that we're worried about here so in an application you know you've got your binary and it gets loaded into memory the way it works is just pretend these numbers here aren't going from lowest actually I'll do it like this we'll go 15 14. I'll do it like this so it makes more sense. So ignore the actual numbers on the spreadsheet. Um, will it fill down? Yes, but not how I want it to. <laughs> Thanks. Not how you expected it. <laughs> um, oh, man. So, 9, 8, 7, oh, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So pretend our memory has 15 memory addresses. Okay. It doesn't. Like I'm going to abstract this. The first few memory addresses... Might get taken up with your... Memory addresses don't start at zero? Question? <laughs> uh, they do. Because <laughs> um, of the whole array start at zero. Yeah. Thing. So this is all abstract anyway, right? So yeah. in reality, memory addresses aren't number. Well, they're hex and there's millions of them. Um, so you'll have your application code or the dot .text component and then you might have some static variables as well that are set in your code. And then you have this thing called the heap, which is dynamically allocated memory for, like, your app might display images, so it'll load them onto the heap. There are such things as heap overflows. Yes. They're just more difficult to pull off than stack overflows. Yes. So what we're doing today is a stack overflow. And the stack starts at the top of the memory space allocated for your app and works its way down. So somewhere they'll meet in the middle and bad things will happen to your app. Uh, you don't ever want that. To, I think there's like ways that they can add in. I'm not too au fait on like when you're looking at the theory of all of this, it always explains it in the concept of like an 8086 processor from 40 <laughs> years ago, where, which could do dynamic memory allocation but couldn't resize bits and pieces. Yeah. So there, I'm going to theorize and say that operating systems can resize the amount of free space available for programs as needed. But anyway, this is the theory of it. And so your stack kind of has um, the the runtime momentary, I'm going to call it the runtime momentary data for your app. So local variables, return memory addresses for execution, so on and so forth. So small bits of data as you go. Yeah. And the stack consists of, so now that that's been done, I can just delete all of this. So the stack consists of a bunch of, um, descending memory addresses. So again, oh, I'm going to be drawing this again, <laughs> doing this again. <laughs> Let's just go five, four, three, two, one. So we've got our things on the stack. And so um, I don't know why all those numbers just disappeared. <laughs> nice. Nice tool. This is not very reliable. Actually, maybe I'll give it some more. Again, this is abstracted. So in reality, your stack's going to have way more stuff and be much more complicated. We'll see that a bit later on. So with your stack, let's just pretend. Um, so each address on the stack can store, um, I've forgotten how many, four bytes. Yes. So normally in like little endian, so the, the bytes you'd expect to be at the end of your data is actually at the start. So I'll just say, you know, EA D4. Uh -huh. So that's the value in the stack there, um, and so on and so forth. And I'll just let's pretend our stack's full of those, because I don't want to write a billion times. Um, 
So the stack consists of, uh, so some there's a couple of pointers that are then involved with the stack. So we have the the base pointer or EBP, if I can type properly. And we have the stack pointer or ESP. So it, on a 64-bit system, these would be RBP and RSP. Yep. On a 16-bit system, these would be BP and SP. Yes. Um, so it all depends on which. How many, how many bit, what the word length is in your operating system for how, what these are called. Um, just kind of go with EBP and ESP. So the base pointer, so the way it works on the stack is you've got, you a construct gets built called a stack frame. So a stack frame is the location on the stack where you're currently doing things. And the base pointer is kind of the base address for where you're, that you reference everything from and the stack pointer is the current part of the stack you're actually looking at. So you can now address values in the stack either by EBP minus one, which would be this address here, or even EBP plus one. So if we're, let's say we've just done a function call and we've just initialized the stack for whatever function we're in. Yep. What happens is that function's arguments could actually be stored in the stack address above or the few stack addresses above where the base pointer is. And so to get those, you might go, give me the data on the stack from EDP plus one or plus two. And that might be your function calls. Function calls can also be passed through the registers, yes. but they're not always. Um, I did find a really cool article that describes all of this as well, so I might link that as well. But effectively, we're now in our, in our stack. As we do things, you know, the stack pointer might move up and down a bit um, and also allocate out zeroed out space. So actually, I'll go through what happens if we just enter a function. So oh, let me put these back. I promise the uh, boring, confusing educational bit will be over soon. <laughs> uh, so what happens is let's say our... It's one of those complicated things that makes sense to you yep. in your own way and it's hard to explain yeah. in a way to make sense. This to is why people. I thought a spreadsheet <laughs> might work. So we've just jumped into our function and ESP is now at this point in the stack. So actually our function, let's just say our function is located at memory address 11223344, which is actually, it'll be located at 44332211. Remembering we're back to front on the bytes, but individual bytes are the correct way around. Yes. It gets confusing, but that's the way it is. So, what actually happens is when we enter the stack, so all of this stuff's zeroed out, and this is zeroed out. So we've just done a call to that address. What gets popped on the stack is that address. And I'll be able to show you this happening in the debugger when we jump there. Um, so that is where the stack pointer currently is. Yes. What then happens is the stack pointer, actually the stack pointer, I think, then moves along one. Um, so the stack point is now here. Now the what happens is an operation happens where the base pointer now equals the stack pointer. So the base pointer um, value is now set to, yeah, actually, yes, the base point is here, my bad. It resets, that, yeah. That is the problem. So, ES, so ESP and the EVP are now set to the same address. So the, no, that's not right. That's just a call. Um, I'm, I'm messing up here. <laughs> Sorry, right. Either way, so that gets popped on the stack. Then the value of the base point, previous value of the base pointer, that's right. So the base pointer is a, v a value of an address further up the stack than we are. So let's say the value of the EVP, previous stack frame, because in functions you talk about stack frames, is address 13 in our stack so that that's dropped on the, the stack and so now our stack pointer is here um, and then what happens is an operation happens where effectively we go EDP equals oh man equals ESP and now the EBP is here and the stack pointer is also there and now what we do is we might go let's free up some space for uh, local variables on the stack. So we free up a bunch of things and the stack pointer's dumped here. Um, 
I'm just going to make that zero. <laughs> um, what then happens is as we load in local values of local variables, we then load them up on the stack. So what we want to do is because the stack works down, but storage works up. So if we were going to store a four memory address, so 16 byte value, I'll just use A, so um, actually, let me try that again. Let's get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, that's how it would work, is we store back up the stack. Yes. So what happens if we keep going up with A's? I could be wrong where EBP is. EBP might be before that. We'll see. Anyway. Um, let me get the right amount of A's because I'm fussy like that. That's too many A's. So what happens if we kept going up the stack, we overwrite this return address. So the stack, effectively you have to think about it as a zero sum game. By the time the program's finished executing, it should be back at the top of the stack. Yes. So as you're going through and doing return, luckily we don't really write assembly these days unless you're doing high performance stuff, I guess. Um, so the compiler handles all this for us, is is all of these calls and returns have to add up. So when our whatever function we've got here and that's using this stack frame finishes up, we're going to hit return and at return, that's right, the last operation is set EBP to the previous stack frame, which will just be a bunch of A's, that doesn't really matter. Uh, and then it'll do the return on that address. So if we sent back a ton of A's, what we then get is an error because it's like, oh, I don't know. It tries to go to the memory address yeah. of all A's, which yes. is not the value so, it's expecting to be. So one of the things that buffer overflows take advantage of is the fact that mm. as far as the program knows, at least with the toll protections turned off, which we've got here, there is no distinction between, between data, executable code, and memory addresses. Yes. So that return function will read this and go, I'm going to go to memory address eight A's and there is nothing there and it freaks out and it seg faults because it's tried to access an invalid memory address. It could be a valid memory address and it might start executing whatever's there. So I've got two forms of buffer overflow to show you. Uh, one that involves abusing that to run application logic that I want it to run that it wouldn't otherwise run. Yep. And one where I'm doing a more traditional stack overflow. So I'm putting my code I want to execute on the stack to abuse. So hopefully this will make more sense once we get into it. But if I quickly show what I've thrown together. So if we go cat easy overflow dot C. That's what we want. So pretty straightforward. I mean, I could have opened this in Vim, I suppose. Um, go away. Uh, so... I've specifically gone, you have to compile it with FNO stack protector. Actually, I had to compile it with another thing again as well. You have to turn off um, ASLR in the operating yeah. system. So yeah. we, we, we have to turn off ASLR in the operating system. Actually, if I go up enough, <laughs> actually, you know what will be easier? It's the echo. Um, History, rep. No, well, there's also, I think I compiled it with it. Yes, oh, this there. exec stack. So by default, and this just goes to show, I think that buffer overflows are potentially a dwindling problem, hopefully, is we had to disable the stack protection, which adds canaries on the stack, which basically the compiler chucks extra code in your app to check canaries on the stack haven't been overwritten. So canaries are effectively specific values that will be looked for and if they're missing something's gone wrong and at that point the kill fails, kill yeah. execution yeah. unless you can absolutely you can get around canaries by absolutely nailing the memory address you need to hit yeah but they do make it harder so i've <coughs> switched them off because this is just meant to be the noobs guide uh, and exec stack which prevents treating the stack like executable code <coughs> so enabling this allows the stack to be treated as executable by the application so effectively, again, the compiler injects code that looks in if you're trying to use memory addresses that are allocated for the stack, it yeah. just won't let them run, it'll error out. Um, and then in the operating system, we had to turn off ASLR, 
operating system ASLR, all it does is shift the m- relative memory addresses around for the app. Yeah, so they're different <coughs> memory addresses every code ex- yeah. uh, every app execution. App level ASLR just jumbles up the app every compile. Yes. So that yeah. it compiles differently every time. Yeah. Um, otherwise, it's all fairly deterministic. Um, anyway, so what we're doing is if we go work backwards from main, we just print something and then we run this login function and we pass argv, which is the command, uh, the actual like kind of thing that was run on the bash terminal. Yeah. So in this case, argv zero is going to be the app itself, the name of the binary running, because it's just literally everything separated by spaces that was on the command line. Yep. Um, and then argv one is your first thing. Two is your second, so on and so forth. After the application, um, then so if we have a look at login, we do a get chat car, which does absolutely nothing. That's purely there because just to make it easy to work with a debugger, I've just made it pause, um, speeds things up a bit. Um, normally in the real world, you don't get such privileges as this, <laughs> um, so I have deliberately made this easy. Um, so then. Where we're creating an input thing, so uh, an input character array, and so this will take args one and dump it an input. Notice though, however, I'm using mem copy because string copy doesn't like null bytes. Yes. So um, there are various ways to do buffer overflows. Mem copy is vulnerable to it. Uh, S prints vulnerable to it. String copy is. Um, string copy read, I think as well. Um, scan or uh, scan scan yeah. f. Yeah. They're all vulnerable in similar ways. So I'm literally telling it here, take the value that I put. So, you know, to be like easy overflow. Oh, let me off that. Yeah. Um, but instead of this, which is running a, the app, taking the output of a Python script, and I just go, lol. Hello, welcome to my security system. Wrong password. Interesting that I get a seg fault. <laughs> I don't know what's causing that. Um, but that that's what happens. Um, <laughs> prints were oh, it's because you're it's a voids maybe. Is it because you're mem copying from Blink to? It might be because I'm mem. Co- I'm deliberately over copying so yeah. that I deliberately overflow. Yeah. So I might anyway. So it, it might be taking. I don't know. Maybe there's extra crap coming in. This is the problem with this sort of stuff. Anyway. Yeah. What happens then is. Um, the path, the actual password we need to check is just the word hello. And if my input equals our special password of hello, uh, run can't touch this. And then that just says, how did you run this? You must be a hacker. Uh, um, so in theory, we don't need this to work, but in theory that should work. Yeah. How did you run this? You must be a hacker. I have a feeling my seg fault might be that this is a void main, not an int main. Oh, because it's not returning the exit yeah. code. Yeah. I, yes. That would make sense. So yeah. let's just ignore that and okay. just pretend this works. Because <laughs> it does work. We can do stuff with it. Um, it's not returning, yeah, yeah, valid exit code. I'm a way better Python person than I am a C person. So. <laughs> that makes sense. For anyone who's still watching after my very boring explanation of the stack. <laughs> um, anyway. So, we've got this far. Um, now we want to try and chuck some random data in. So if I run easy overflow, and we're passing in... Well, so it's 100, 100 bytes get allocated for this. So if I just do this, what I should get is... Oh yeah, I'll still get wrong password. Yeah. It doesn't help that I sh- I should see a seg fault anyway. Yes. So normally the biggest indicator that you might have a buffer overflow vulnerability is the fact that bad user input causes a seg fault. Yes. So we then use... Oh, what was the name of that? Um, actually. Um, Patent Create. Yeah, that's right. Patent Create. So there are tools we can use to help find these overflows so um if you remember back to when we were streaming on twitch we talk a little bit about subshells in bash yes so uh there's this dollar sign and brackets as a subshell so effectively it's run whatever command you put between the brackets and then the text output from that pass into this over here so if i 
than did or say add to the command that you're running. Yeah. Yeah. So if I did echo test. Or echo hello well, might have been better. Yeah. It'll run. Well, you yeah. must be a hacker. Anyway. Um, that's a better idea. Yeah. Yeah. You must be a hacker. So it's actually just running echo hello. So we then want uh, pattern create. Which it's actually MSF pattern create. Um, I love it how they mix hyphens and underscores. <laughs> MSF underscore pattern create, and then it's the number, isn't it? Uh, dash L for the length. Dash capital L or lowercase? Lower L, yeah. Yep. And then a number for how long you want it, yeah. It's going to go for 1,000. That takes a while to do its thing. Pattern create <coughs> is a slow script, yeah. <laughs> it effectively creates, I'm sure there is an upper limit to it, but an arbitrary length unique string where every point in the string is unique or every eight byte sequence yes. so yeah. that you get memory. Just so now we're going to attach our debugger because we need this to attach to give us the specific seg fault. Otherwise we get the generic terminal uh, seg fault. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is hit that. Yeah, you voided a main seg fault. And it gives us the issue uh, at so basically what's happening here is we overwrote the stack and the base pointer. So when the return function got called, it tried to go to that memory address of 64413, which was a garbage memory address, basically. Um, uh, uh, if you just uh, click play, play or yeah, yeah. do that. Um, okay, so we then use MSF pattern offset. And then that would be the same number. Oh yeah, it is the same number, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, because we've done this before. And that'll tell us at what point on the stack, like right. at what point in our in our input do we overflow? So hundred and twelve yeah. bytes below where we get our the start of our control. Which means uh if I get this right, hundred and twelve A's. Yes. So, so if if we input 112 A's and then the memory address that we want to add to our return, yeah, we should get we should control uh, code execution flow. So let me just copy this because we'll we'll create an example overflow yep. pi to overflow string pi to fun far out. Yes, we'll go to string. We'll go to string overflow string. Um, this is in Python 2 because it's, I just know how bytes work in Python 2, whereas in Python 3, they're a bit more fickle. I'm sure if I like actually Googled or looked at the docker, I'd understand <laughs> in the blink of an it, instant. It wouldn't actually be probably that much. No. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to ignore all this stuff up here. <laughs> We're not even using ERP override anymore. Nope. Um, just going to, uh, 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 uh. Um, times 112. Yeah. So we're going to go times 100 and. No, you want it to be 12. Well, yes, yeah, sorry. And you want to add four <coughs> Bs or something else to it. Um, so the. Um, so these are the byte codes for the characters yeah. capital A and capital B. So. Or is, is this lower for 60, I think? So they might be lower. Yeah. I've said they're lowercase. Yeah. So. 40 years capital. So what we're doing is we're going add the byte x61 112 times and the byte x62. Well, the x is just slash x is the Python thing, but essentially 112 a's, 4 b's. And then uh, print that. And then that output goes into our. Jeez, I don't know why I just don't use history. I'm such an idiot. Anyway. Um, the string, right? Yep. String. So now if we run this, again, it just stops with the get characters purely to make it easier to attach with the debugger. Um, in the real world, you've got to play around a bit differently. Some of the other examples we did ages back were a bit different. Yeah. Um, so in EDB, we've got this is kind of the currently executing assembly. Uh, our registers over here. I've never used a data dump. Um, and the stack. So we can see these are all those returns I was talking about. 
So, so yeah, the data dump is used when you start getting into fuzzing. Uh, when you're, yeah, when you're yeah. looking for bad characters and things like that, you use the data dump just to see how it's processing the byte codes that you're sending it. Yeah. yeah. So a key operation when it comes to the stack is the pop instruction. So 5D summarizes to pop EBP. 5A summarizes the pop EDX. So effectively all it's doing is this is returning the value currently on the stack to the base pointer. So yeah. So which means we're going to, we're preparing to return to our previous stack frame. So EBP now gets set. I have to head out to here. So EBP now is whatever was on the stack. Actually not yet. Now. Um, so FFF D078, which is a memory address stack down here somewhere. Um, then we're popping whatever was there into EDX and whatever's there into ECX. So those might be returns from a function, return values. They might be coming back through. So in, I think they've got like fast call and standard call or something like that in C. You don't really see it because the compiler handles it for you, but you can override compiler behavior. And what will happen is the compiler will then either pop return variables into the stack or into the heap if there's tons of them and they're massive or into registers. Um, and then this return, notice it lines up with this. So this even knows there's a return based on concept. The de debugger's kind of smart. Um, but this, we're going to jump to F7 EB 5407. So if we do that, F7 EB 5407, bit hard to see, but there we are. And then I'm just going to jump through a whole bunch because we need to get back to... We need to get to a point where we yeah, can see easy all overflow. of our A's onto our... The advantage yeah. of where I have the get cars is we're not too far away. So to try and use the debugger from the start... So that earlier debugger debugging example I did was super... Compiled super simple and it was super easy to navigate. Yeah. This thing is not so where the get cars is drops us off at the right point that we're not too far away to get back to um easy overflow you can see down on the stack we're heading towards it um and da, 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 and here we are so back in easy overflow so if we look we haven't done mem copy yet so we won't see our stuff in there yet in the stack yet uh because mem copy is just here yep so uh, we're gonna do some stuff uh, Where we see all of our A's. I'm going to step over mem copy. Um, so that's pointing to a memory address with all our A's. Yes. And then, which is where the mem copy, that's from the mem copy. But notice they're all in the stack. Um, and we have a ton of A's. And I am wondering why this has actually got the correct address in it. Yeah, we ran over. Oh, did I not save overflow stream? Or did I... Uh, oh, I edited the wrong one. <laughs> oh. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. We'll just give you a little preview for what we'll show you later. Um, jump, jump, jump. <laughs> just going forwards. All this is doing is zeroing out um, some values. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, so this is that zeroing out to make room for yeah. some data that you were talking about. Yeah, it about. zeroed out all the stuff here. Yeah. Um, then jump not equal. So that's basically the part where you said input is a hundred bytes. Yeah. Uh, it's zeroed out a hundred bytes worth of space on the stack because that's what yeah. it, it's expecting to receive. Uh, so right. So now notice we're onto our last pop into EVP and we're about to balk EVP. Like I was saying, the base pointer is about to become... <laughs> I'm about to ruin this. Like, you know that meme? I'm about to ruin this whole man's career. <laughs> and EBX has already been polluted with random crap. So the thing with buffer overflows is you can end up in unstable configurations, which happened to me a bunch of times, yes. where like, it turned out the correct value needed to be in a register. So if you do it wrong, you can bulk stuff. So now we're about to jump to this 56, 55, 70 BF address, which we can go back and have a look in the Python in a sec. But that jumps us over here. Uh, so I'm having to trampoline off another instruction. We can't just jump straight to the stack and treat it as um, executable, executable code. code. We need a yeah. call. 
either a jump ESP or call ESP function. And so I looked through my code. It's funny, the version Jake compiled didn't have call ESP. Yeah. So his operating system might have had different versions because he's running Parrot. Yeah, I compiled on Parrot, which I think compiled it differently and had no yeah. call ESPs potentially, or jump ESPs. Or... Potentially all you need is a different version of GCC or some other library or something. Which meant, I and I found this by eyeballing. Um, I didn't find it by looking for it. But we now call ESP, and ESP is this address, which is actually on the stack, just here. And we're about to run the code that's on the stack. And then this is just, we should be able to see what it's doing. ETC password. So the at the moment, the shell code that's running, uh, all it does is it's meant to add a user without a password uh, to your passwords file doesn't really do anything because that's not where you you need to set shadow password as well i think for it to actually work properly but um yeah i don't think you can actually yeah. use that account to log into the but computer with if we have a look and so these are the memory addresses that these point to not the actual values in the register the register wouldn't fit that much no um and now we're building so this q o o q so q kook 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 um so that's like what the string for the uh, for password looks like. Um, da, 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 da. And then debug ex exited normally with status three. It didn't seg fault. <laughs> Maybe when you debug, it stops it from seg faulting or it like returns zero. I Maybe, don't know. Maybe it knows. Anyway, yeah. but if we uh, cat etc password down the bottom there, um, you get that. Um, so let's just, uh, again, this is all we can, what we can do is we can run a few different shell codes and, and yeah. show you. And actually what I might do is even like, like what I did to first check this is build my own very simple shell code yep. that doesn't do too much. Um, okay. So I will now run with the correct Python script, just so you can see <laughs> what we, what, actu what we were what trying I to actually meant to show you, <laughs> not the final final thing, just so it makes more sense. So remember, we had we're 112 A's, 112 four B's. A's and four B's. Yeah. So I, you're just gonna have to excuse a bunch of clicking, because uh, this is the only way to get back to. Oh, that probably yeah. won't do anything. <laughs> that machine gun fire like finger on him. <laughs> Hey, I play a lot of bottle. No, I haven't played Borderlands in ages. Right, so we're back in Easy Overflow. So this is our mem copy. We're just going to step over because we do not need to go through that. Yeah, that's half the challenge with debugging is if you accidentally step into the wrong thing. Okay, so here we are. Here are all our A's and then our B's. Yeah, and so if we follow along up the top yeah. and look at ESP and EBP as we keep stepping yeah. through. So what's also, I will say, what is confusing is here the stack goes from like low to high in the order. So the stack here is actually represented upside down from what I was doing earlier, yeah. which is why it looks weird. But the debugger does that to help yeah. us as humans. Yes. So in many ways, you just start ignoring these addresses. You look might reference a specific address, but you just need to know that these are incremental addresses, eight bytes each. Yes. So four bytes each. Um, and we get our Bs. So what we're now going to do is we're just going to go da, 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 da. Keep going down. Uh, interesting. EBP. Oh, that's the value at EBP. So we've already overwritten EBP, um, I think. Because it's at FFF. F no, it's D2 still at a valid pointer. So we actually, we haven't overwritten its actual value yet. Okay. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Um, no, Because that's just correct. what's, that's just a preview of what's at that memory address. Yes. Yeah. Um, so. We're allocating some space on the stack. So you see the stack clearing out down there. So that's what I was talking about for locals. It had already, mem copy had already done that for what we'd copied to the stack. So you, you could have, we could have gone through mem copy, but we'd be gone for days. I did it once. I stepped through this entire thing. <laughs> yep. And it was like 45 minutes of Jake listening to me go, okay, I think it's doing this. I think it's doing this. When you're looking at the same 10 basic instructions the CPU uses, you, after a while, you're just like, I don't have a clue where I am. Uh, test EAX, EAX. Uh, I remember there was a reason for checking that something equals itself. 
Um, and now if we look at the stack pointer, we're still good. The base pointer, we're still good. If we go down, we're going to step over. Oh, actually, it stepped over for us. Um, now it's going to print out something for us, which we're going to skip over, but that's the wrong password. And then a random knob. And then load an effective address. Uh, pop. And then pop. And so if you have a look, EBX is now 61616161. Yeah. EDI is about to be 61616161. EBP is about to be 61616161. And then this return will set the stack pointer to, well, it errored. <laughs> but at that point, the stack pointer would become 62626262. But yeah, yeah. there we go. I just had to step again. Yeah. So, and that is not a valid address. It doesn't appear to be mapped to the memory space of the running app. And it, and it has a freakazoid. And game over. So, yeah. So here we can see, it's hard to read behind that blue, but the ESP is the 626262. Yeah. yeah. Um, EIP is 6262662 as well. Um, so, all good. So... Uh, if we go so basically what we've been able to prove there is that we can control code execute execution flow so the next steps now is for us to find instead of all b's find a valid memory address which has a assembly instruction that will let us perform code execution or call the success function instead of the failed wrong password function uh, so i'm going to run this again just to show that point which means we're going to have to spam through everything again uh right so we're here uh, just to get that moving return return when we were prepping i accidentally went went a bit too far and we ended up <laughs> when we ended up we ended up somewhere random. Yep. Uh, I was like, "This, we're not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy." <laughs> um, okay, so we're back in Easy Overflow. So I literally was looking for a call ESP like this. Just do 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 do. Once you get past like the actual end of the app, there's a bunch of code that never runs. So stuff in grey never runs, um, or does nothing. Um, pretty sure never runs. Um, and there was a bunch. And then randomly down here, more stuff. Uh, maybe gray means does nothing. Um, anyway, I literally just was scrolling around and some here and there's a junk down here which I could never see run in any other context. Uh, there is a... Uh, call ESP somewhere. Call ESP. That's a different... Oh no, here we are. At... 565570BF. So let's write that down. So 565570BF. 70BF. Except the way we need it is BF 705556. Um, because again, little Indian for the uh, four bytes. And then from there, that'll give us, that'll jump to whatever the ESP is set to. Yes. So. So if we over change our B's yeah. to set ESP to yeah. So when so when that returns so those B's need to be set to this address. And then after the B's we have our code because the yes. stack pointer because the return's like a fancy pop. It effectively pops the value of the stack at that memory address into EIP, which goes off and runs whatever's at EIP. Yeah. Um so that's all return is as a fancy um, pop. Um, it's probably made more than that. I probably there's probably <laughs> some like standard Unix engineer who's like, "What? How dare you say that? I spent seventy five years building the return function." Um, <laughs> man. Uh, anyway, so whatever. So whatever goes after our our override kind of address here is going to run. So I'm quickly going to look up 
it's going to be run as executable code, um, not as. So if I look at x86 characters. Um, instruction set, I'll just pick something super simple. I'm pretty sure, like I'll, I'll just like zero at a register or something like that. I'll add one to a register. This is not going to be the right one. Uh, uh, assembly. I'll just say assembly. Um, that's the one I had a look at. Uh, opcode and instruction reference might be good enough for me. Uh, maybe There's not. A, there is a command in Linux that does it. I think it's called like Nassim Shell. Uh, so what we're looking for is just some example of opcodes or instructions. Um, <laughs> oh, maybe I did that in Firefox on my desktop, not hey, in my VM. I think that's Grub. Hey, Grub. Hey, man. Um, that's not particularly useful. Um, um, increment register. Because this is just the easiest way to kind of ink by one. He said he said he's increment. That's RM. That's not what I want. I want uh, flags affected. Where did I find it? I don't know. Who that is. <laughs> opcodes. Final search for opcodes. So grab just for, for context. We're working on a, a buffer buffer overflow and rather than like use some pre canned shell code i just want to create my own super simple shell code to show that some operations are happening uh push pop that's oh. just i remember i found a reference that was really easy to understand ah opcode reference stack overflow often has useful examples um Oh, that's this one again. Mnemonic. Because um, I do want the... Actually, maybe this is what we want. Uh... Sorry, again, we've just hit one of those really entertaining, boring bits. Increment by one. Where was that? Ink up. By one. Oh, yeah. uh, what does that increment by one, though? One, though. I don't know. <laughs> um... Push, import, output. There was a nice one, which was just increment this thing by one or decrement it by one. And I, I suppose, like, I could just put nops there. That it demonstrated, I suppose, Yeah. is nops. And maybe, uh, um, but I suppose we can also look for a, ah, oh, I could just use this. So... Um, where's a nice easy one? Let's push D word F2 FF. So that's our call ESP FF D4. Uh, add. Um, 7A might be. Yeah, okay. <laughs> if I jump all the way back up. Okay, there's a bunch of ads. Uh, 0, 0, and then op 1. Oh, register. That's what that is. Um, except I have to... I don't know what all the codes are for the registers. That's my challenge. But I'll just put nops in. Screw it. Nops yeah. will get the job done. Anyway, when we were playing around last week, I had it doing some very basic stuff. Effectively, you could all you're doing uh, is writing your own... So I'll just detach that and let that kill itself. All you're doing is effectively writing your own assembly so shell code i mean you can probably take it from compiled c yeah but shell code is just opcodes on assembly um so oh where's my notes over here so bf705556 is what we need here because that's the memory address of our call esp so 56 x Never leave out their slash X's. I've done that too many times no. and been like, why is my thing broken? Oh, uh, 70 and BF. Right. 
Um, Luck, I just did that. No, hang on. You already reversed it for a notepad. So now you've just reversed <laughs> it back again. Uh, I've reversed a reversal. <laughs> yeah, you've reversed a reverse. So <laughs> um, I'm a genius. 56. No, 70. Uh, 70, 55, 56. Uh, 75. Oh, man, 56. What did I hit? F11, yeah. And then plus B and then... Uh, 90 is... Um, yeah. yeah. So we'll just go that times... Uh, let's say 10. Uh, so uh, 90 is no ops. And no ops... It's basically a do nothing. Yeah, do move, do nothing, move to the next instruction. Yes. Um, another form of stack overflows involve no op sled. So yes, right now I can very accurately control the memory address. Sometimes you can't, but yep. you know the general area it's going to jump to, yep. and you can use a no op sled. So I'm jumping. I'm effectively jumping to after the memory address I control. Sometimes you can only jump back to an address before. At that point, you'd have a no op sled to your code, yeah, and then run your code. So that's an option as well. But because I've got to call ESP, I can I can do this. Uh, so if I haven't completely balked it up, which is always an option, failure is always an option. Uh, attach. Easy overflow. Okay, uh, and now you just get to listen to me machine gun through this again because of where it drops me in. Again, I don't know why, and I'm still learning in this area, but my this the last one I did with the debugging one compiled like so nicely, <laughs> Jacob. It just made it just made so much sense. And now it this did. is a spaghetti mess. Um, we're gonna jump over mem copy, and now if we have a look, uh, we see all the nineties. Fifty six, fifty five, seventy BF. Yep, that's that's what we want. That's what we want to see, where we want to see it. The number of times I did this, and that was offset by one byte because <laughs> I'd screwed up with my Python and yep. like got my bytes wrong. Um, so we're just going to keep jumping forwards. I can probably actually just do a, a breakpoint before this return and jump straight there. Yes. That speeds up some time. So now we're going to pop all A's into EBP. Sorry, EBP. And then we're going to do a return to our call ESP, like we did earlier. And from here, we take another step. No up. We can no see up. that, yeah, our no ESP up. No up. was pointing no to all of our knots. No up. Ah. Oh. See, there we are. <laughs> That's all you need. 47, needed. Inc. EDI. So, okay. And then we just run that and it's going to crash because it's... It gets, it gets to the end of those knocks and goes, hang on, now what am I supposed yeah. to do? <laughs> it starts running into instructions <laughs> that rely on registers being set correctly that are no longer set correctly. Yeah. So just to, and just to make the point a bit more obvious, um, I'll do it once more. <laughs> Jacob is very tired. Yeah, but sorry about that. after this, there's only one more kind of thing I want to show before we uh, wrap up for the night. Um, okay, so um, do that. I just need to go back to up, up. Man, I I must look like a noob to some gun out there. You could like, do a go to address and put a breakpoint if it's like, you're really bothered. You're such an idiot, Reese. It's probably just as quick to just put. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Radio, and now I'm just going to go down to my. So we've got the can't touch this, that's the print or the put string. We want a breakpoint there, we're just gonna run to there. And again, if we look in our memory, we're now here. Oh, 47 is also a G, uh, capital G. So now we do a return, call ESP. And if we have a look at EDI, it's 61, 61, 61, 61. And now it's going up. Yeah. So effectively, from here on, if you actually knew assembly better than I did, yep. you would actually be able to build some meaningful code that does something. Yeah. Which and is this... which is where Shellstorm comes in. Yes. Because other people have written so if I can find uh, Linux uh, Intel eighty x eighty six sixty four. 
Um, what's a simple one that's not going to be like tedious, like shut down? Read etc password could oh, be interesting. There's the finesse hack one. Uh, like 27 bytes. Yeah, that one could work. And we've got enough room with 27 bytes. Yeah. Um, um, it's, oh, it's a one liner as well. Sometimes they uh, put them across lines and you have to reformat it for the Python. But effectively, we're just hijacking. You can wrap it in brackets too. Effectively, yeah. we're just hijacking this. Um, Let's see if we can pop a shell. So, kind of. And here is what the instructions look like for that. So. Um, yeah, so that's basically all of those bytecodes converted back into their. Ooh, this is, looks like it's for 64 bits. And my app is not 64 bits. They look like 64 bits. That's addresses. a chungus of a memory yeah. address, mate. Um, specifically. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, no, I just they need to find x86. Oh, yeah. I'm a dumbass. There you ass. go. You're in the wrong. Yeah. There'll be one for the x86 yeah. version. I could compile this to be 64 bit, but then we'd have to find the overflows again. Yeah. Um, Vines H, null free polymorphic. Um, there's a lot of them. So the one I showed you earlier just writes um, to file IP tables flush. So that kills all your like, IP tables rules, I think. Um, that one doesn't work. I tried it. It doesn't no? work. Okay. Uh, add root user with no password. So that's the one I had. Effectively, it that's it just pushing. Um, so I think I found a root in there because it was like had re repeating characters. But um, oh no, over here. So root. Um, yeah. So that was the one I was using. Uh, bind sh. That changes shadow to be world readable. Set UID. Um, edit etc sudoers port bind four 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 four. There's lots and lots and lots. Um, uh, bin cat. You know what? We'll do that one. Bin cat etc password. Um, it's a double line, but this one's not too hard to sort out. You can wrap it in brackets, can't you? In Python. Ah, uh, yeah. Whatever. I'll just quickly do it. So we're going to detach. Um, uh, vim overflow.py. This just involves a bit of formatting. Surely we'll, yeah, I'll edit the shell code variable. Um, da -da 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 -da. This is very interesting for everybody to watch. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, 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 uh. Okay. Control Shift D. Now, don't worry about the munted formatting. It's fine. Because we're about to fix it. And, and this looks good. I know. I remember there are shortcuts to get to the beginning of lines, and guess what? I wasn't using them. <laughs> um, okay. Now, instead of all our plus 47s, I mean, we could stick a few knops in there if we wanted to. Um, we just go plus shellcode and now we let the magic happen um, so we're going to run this again you know what I'm not even going to worry about running the debugger I think we've done that enough times yeah overflowed so we can see that we over ran the buffer overflow, executed some code to do something else that the wasn't part of the original application. And in this case, we catted our password file. So the other one I want to show, overflow, and I think it was dash, reflow. How did you run this? You must be a hacker, but notice it's wrong password. And how did you run this? I will run this one through the debugger, and this is the last one we'll do before we call it a night. Okay. Um, Attach. So I, so there is also a thing called return oriented programming. I suppose this is like the proto version of that. We we did do it for one of our hack the box machines. I can't remember which one, but it was the one with the yeah the rock. Yeah, it's commonly called rock, but it's the yeah. return. Yeah, where you you basically abuse chunks of code. This really isn't rock. This is just I'm going to call it proto rock. <laughs> uh, 
because we're actually jumping back to other replication logic already there's, in our application. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of um, this variants in, of it. This, in some ways, you could consider similar to what I've done in the debugger last time. Yes. So yes. we're still going to jump over mem copy. But now, if we have a look for all our A's, NBUV is our new memory address. So UV is the 5655. Yeah. And MB, so and that's, this... just the, that's just it converting it to ascii that's the ascii representation of those that's bytes. not what the actual address is the actual yeah. address is this 56 55 62 6 e. yeah and that's where when we're talking about executable versus non-executable bytes yeah. so if i go here and skip forward to here it just says wrong password but now if i go here where esp is now jumped over here and now we're going to call that can't touch this function. So it's labeled that handily for us. Yes. And then now we're up in that can't touch this function. I'm just gonna step over that and step over that. And how did you run this? You must be a hacker. If you remember back to the um uh patch the overflow.c if you remember back to here, this function here, how did you run this? You must be a hacker, which you can technically only get to if both these compare. So for most of the buffer overflowing, we didn't even care about that function. We cared about abusing this yes. to get a buffer overflow to control the stack. But initially, I was trying to just override that to run this. Yeah. Um, this, a buffer overflow, is really no different to SQL injection or cross-site scripting. It's you're, kind of the app-level version. You're just taking control of what should be running yeah. Uh, so if you're ever somewhere that does stuff with C or other languages that are vulnerable to this, so C++, C, some um, programs, and sometimes even Java's had them in the interpreter, I think ages back was the last one. It's pretty rare and hard yeah. in those languages. If they've built yeah. them properly. Yeah. Uh, Rust and Go, or certainly Rust isn't vulnerable to this stuff. I don't think Go is either. Or Rust is vulnerable to another tier of different things. All you do is you move the problems elsewhere. But... <laughs> If you're ever in an organization and working on legacy software, uh, they probably don't have the stack protection and ASLR enabled. They do incur a performance overhead, just not very big. Yeah. Um, if I compiled it just by itself, for example, um, and let's call this Easy Overflow 2. <laughs> um, so I don't and go easy overflow to and then did a ton of A's. What we should see um, is not that because that's probably not enough A's. Also, the seg fault is because I forgot to make my main function in it. Um, at some point though, it should freak out, but it's not. Um, either way, with all of that enabled, if we tried to do a bunch, so, what would happen is that we go, no, sorry, I'm not going to... Maybe stack smashing detection is not enabled by default for me anyway. Maybe GCC on Kali doesn't have it enabled. Because you can enable default flag. Maybe. But effectively, if, if that was enabled, I should be seeing like a, uh, you're trying to smash the stack kind of error. Um, there are packers and stuff that also make it a lot harder. Not packers, but there are other ways of compiling apps to make this a lot harder. Um read the documentation for your compiler, I guess. Yeah. Generally, most modern languages handle it all for yeah. you. It's really the the lower level languages, if you yeah. like. I think earlier versions of Python, which basically passed stuff through to sprint, yeah. were vulnerable to this um, in certain circumstances. So higher level things can be vulnerable if they rely on vulnerable low level things. Yes. Uh, that haven't been sorted. It all, but it all depends how they wrap those lower level but calls. That's no different to if you used um, uh, Django or any number of the Java web frameworks or PHP frameworks, where those frameworks might abstract away writing database functions, but those frameworks might have vulnerabilities themselves in yes. that area. Yeah, anyway, it does so that's just to say that that's kind of our <laughs> man rambling <laughs> discussion of buffer, overflow. buffer overflows uh it works quite well which i was good i was a bit 
pre-stream, we were a bit worried that something was wrong, and then we realized our shell code was just that I would left it at just updating <laughs> that that file. So again, I'll try and do a link to that modern video gamer channel because that had some interesting stuff about how this sort of stuff was abused with consoles to bypass security. Um, and I think it's important to learn the techniques because then you can learn how to defend against them. Yes, um, definitely. The, I'll see if I can find a good link to describe the stack and how the stack works and yep. some of the basic instructions. Yep. Uh, and then I'll look... F and then... Uh, and there's plenty it? of different ways of doing this sort so of thing as well. Docco and opcodes? I remember. What was the other thing I was going to link to? Anyway, I'll link to a bunch of stuff in the description when this thing just goes on YouTube proper as a, as a video. Yep. Cheers, guys. See ya. Uh... uh let me just find the right place to end this. <laughs> Later, everybody. Bye.